is Phil and uh, thanks for us for the afternoon, which is great. And uh, it's interesting to have a different uh, convening uh, entity for our conversations, but very nice to see a uh, few uh, faces in the audience. Um, uh, so thanks to Nick for the uh, invitation. Uh, the work I'm talking about is uh, funded to, uh, some of it by the SRC Urban Transformations uh, uh, Group, which I think Michael is uh, part of too, so I just acknowledge that uh, funding support. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is um, uh, really where are the urban political challenges of this age, so called urban age? Where are they exactly to be found? I think quite often we see these kind of headline uh, effects of globalisation and urbanisation today, which is about vast new kinds of urban forms, um, very rapid urbanisation in some places, things that are really confounding our imaginations as urbanists. Um, and we tend to think these have very powerful consequences for urban governments. Uh, usually they're about things like managing and governing global cities. So here I have my favourite local city uh, from Kaute in Johannesburg, uh, which is now sprawling across three already very large uh, metro metropolitan uh, areas, <laughs> and um, uh, really providing very intense challenges for managing uh, urban processes. So that's for sure. But I think quite often we forget that the corollary of these <coughs> huge mega urban regions and the loss of control, really, and the search for new forms of uh, governance, uh, the corollary is that urban governance is in fact intensely fragmented, uh, patchwork developments here and there, um, very much associated with uh, seeking to extract value from the city, from urban land, from urban life, from urban experience. Um, and there's lots of global pressures, money circling around saying, let us in, let us build something enormous, make a lot of money, some accomplish project, perhaps. Um, uh, and, and at the same time, there's a lot of local efforts to capture value. So I think what I'm interested in is some political misdirections around uh, in our analysis of uh, this urban age. Misdirection in scale, so looking at this global city region as our big confounding problem, how do we manage that? Not paying attention to the nature of the micro politics. What is actually going on and actually shaping? Developments we see in cities, which by all accounts are horrible. Um, so, looking more closely at this micro politics of urban development, and the question that I'm, I'm pondering at the moment in the wake of our uh, case study, which I'll talk about a little bit now, is how exactly is urbanity being created? Is it being protected? Is it being destroyed by the kinds of uh, processes that we've seen? What kind of city is being made? What kind of urban future is being constructed? And here I think that for once, I think the policy uh, community uh, will find some friends in urban theory. That is, that I think these confounding urban themes <coughs> are asking our theorists very profound questions. What, how do we talk about them? What are they? What vocabulary do we use to describe these uh, supposed urban processes? New kinds of spatialities are coming uh, to the fore in terms of how we describe and understand the city. And I think here yeah, the deterritorialization of the urban, which is one of the profoundest uh, consequences of the current urban age, um, suggests that we need to have a better imagination about the challenges of urban governance. Urban governance is deterritorialized, both stretched out and fragmented locally. Then old idioms of how to improve governance, how to do things in the city, how to intervene, our old idioms are very bad for and turning for inspiration to thinking about the ways in which multiple overlapping networks and flows, a vast variety of different transnational agents active in so many different cities, that this, this is the problematic of urban governance. It's not whether we can form a, a boundary around something and manage it well. The problematic is how do we exactly engage in this complex intersection between vast globalizing processes, powerful actors, and a lot of local initiatives to do things, often in a very local basis, so the project basis. <coughs> Here, I think a great uh, French political scientist, uh, Gilles Pinson, has written about Gouverneur la vie par projet, governing the city by project. And it's at that scale that I'm interested in looking. And I think here we see exactly how it is that different. 
different kinds of urban political configurations emerge and shape the city. Quite different ones in different places, that's for sure. And a great new book by a young champion called Cities for Profit, not many words, looks at different case studies from a across Asia and the complex kinds of political configurations that lead very often to land appropriation, land theft, mass displacement, uh, corrupt uh, appropriation of the benefits of land development, and uh, various kinds of uh, assemblages of, um, uh, of powerful agents uh, and uh, relevant imaginations. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is who is appropriating this value? Who's interested in it? What is it doing to our cities? Um, and I think it's not a trivial question, in the sense that we have not only hordes of uh, investors wanting to come into cities and realize value for their purposes, but we have strong programs of development plan for the poorest cities on the planet. And uh, Sue Parnell is hovering around and pr promoting a very, a very strong analysis of these um, uh, 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 developments at an international scale, a global scale. Habitat. Uh, three sustainable development goals. These are very important developments, things to claim. And I think Michaela and Sue's work on this has been really very powerful and interesting for us to uh, learn from and understand. But what will be the effect of interventions in the city to try and realize certain development goals? What coalitions and actors will be realized? What land will be developed? How will it be funded in each local uh, situation in this configuration? So I'll take us uh, through quite quickly now, I probably only have a few minutes uh, to do it. A, a case in London. So here's a really reasonably well-regulated city with quite a lot of capacity and resources and so on. What happens here in terms of capturing land value? And what I've become quite interested in are London's spaces of exception. Places that are very lightly regulated in planning terms, places where almost anything goes perhaps, or we can break lots of planning rules. Uh, to achieve uh, development. Why is this happening? Who is interested in it? Um, it's, it's all based on land value capture, so developments in London very often, they must finance themselves, they must capture the land value in order to do the infrastructure, to make the complex public-private spaces, to provide the social infrastructure for new people, etc. Um, so all of this comes out of the land value. Scrapped by who? Um, so London has this context where there's a fantasy that the city's growing so very fast, we have these crises. Uh, numbers are, are you know, there, but not there, so we need to look at them closely at that. But certainly London is a growing metropolis. Where are we going to put those people? Well, one answer would be to stretch the city, like so many places do. But there's an intransigent politics about that. So instead, as the lead plan of the London plan often says, London must eat its own smoke. Very bold of us. So now we eat up our, our social housing estates, we eat up our brownfield land, we eat up our railway land, and we declare places of opportunity for development. These have become known as opportunity areas for a long time. So the map on the left is from 1993. So starting with the end of the GLC, starting with the example of the Docklands, and London started to identify London's planners and politicians start to identify places where development could happen, largely places of deindustrialization um, or where changing uh, configurations of, of activities uh, lead to opportunities for new land use. And these continue to be very present. So this is the current London plan depiction on the right hand side. So we have these little pictures of London. Opportunities! Ah, oh, So opportunity areas are main places where housing is going to be delivered. So London needs a lot of housing. So this is a, a really a lot of London's future housing supply is going to be in these places. And because they're kind of leftover places, now disused places, or hard to reach places with poor infrastructure, actually they're really difficult to develop. Um, and so the last mayor suggested that these areas could just develop their own character, forget about what's around, go as high as you like, create a whole new image of the city, densify, etc. So this is what is going on. And I think all credit to community groups in London that they are constantly badgering away at this issue. That is, um, uh, what is the outcome of these developments? Is to displace people, to lose strong use values, to forget about what was there in the first place, to lead to outcomes that are not very um, valued. So there's been quite a lot of contestation, but in fact, with little effect. Uh, the current mayor, similarly, is suggesting that opportunity areas can take a bespoke approach to housing. 
they can uh, forget about uh, the affordable housing expectations that our RPA is trying to stringently take forward. You need to take account of the specific site um, instead. And if you look here, this is the density matrix for the London plan. In the very bottom right hand side, you find the densities that are associated with the most central areas in London. These densities are currently being developed in some suburban neighborhood near you. <laughs> um, and it's that pressure for densification and production of urban spaces that we may not find very appealing that I'm quite interested in trying to understand. Why is that coming about? I've been looking at this case study of the Old Open Park Royal Development Corporation. So it's an unusual opportunity area in that the mayor has declared a, a separate corporation to run and manage it. It's a very large scale uh, for Canary Walk and Open Park there. This is what the houses currently look like, your usual London terraces and semis. Um, this is the fantasy on the bottom left hand side, the initial vision. This is what we could have here. The reason why it's a strong area for development was the HS2 station is planned for there and the bus truck station. So quickly connected up to all sorts of places. Currently, an awful lot of railway land. Do we need places for trains to be fixed, turn around, travel through? Sure, the city needs those things. So, what does it mean when we're trying to? Um, we develop uh, parts of the city that provide us with a significant use value. Top right hand side is a new format of housing in London, the sort of co living idea where you're a graduate person with a bit of money, you rent a tiny little room, you have good public spaces, and it's a kind of lost leader for developers in, in new neighborhoods like this, where there's a lot of construction traffic. I'm not going to spend my you know, hard earned um, uh, capital in my house on a property that's just about to become a construction site, but somebody might go and live there who would prefer um, uh, to have a nice environment internally and not care so much about the neighbourhood. So what is the balance of things going on here? The funding for the infrastructure in this area is two and a half billion pounds, quite a lot. And the government and the mayor acknowledges expenses to be paid for from development, but the mayor has also stated that actually that's not going to happen. It's not going, it's not viable on that basis. Um, if you start to try and develop it on this basis, you lose your, your charges for, for development, you lose your planning day charges, the sale charges, etc. You can do less and less affordable housing, which is what the graph there shows. You're trying to uh, get more affordable housing, you get less planning day, you can pay less for the infrastructure. How are you going to get two and a half million pounds? No. So you're not going to get affordable housing. And in fact, the review of the PTC uh, looking at this increasing infrastructure cost concludes that actually what's likely to happen is that you'll end up with a quantum and scale of development that's unacceptable and high scale density or mass. And frankly, the residents agree with this. 